morning. Good morning. What up? How's everybody doing? It's so good to see everybody, man. Oh, I love you all. You're all so good. Hey, if you have your Bibles or electronic devices, turn with me to John 21. I believe God has a really great word for us this morning. And um, if you don't have your Bible, there's a one, hopefully one in the front of your seat. And of course, we'll put some of the verses on the, on the screen for you. So recently I was in San Diego with my beloved Joanne. And uh, we were down there with, with a group of pastor leaders from around the, uh, the Western Coast. And just really good time. And so we had a chance to go for a nice long, long walk. And uh, we went down, if you've ever been down to downtown San Diego, they have what's called the MLK Promenade. So it's about a mile long walk. And it's just different quotes from Martin Luther King Jr. And so it made me reflect not only on the memory of one of my heroes, um, but uh, reflect on what we're doing today in our series and about love and so many things that he said were about that. And so that first picture there, yeah, that's, that's the artwork that's there. It's uh, representing, of course, this idea of breaking the chains. And <clears throat> this is what it says there. We can put the next one up there. It'll be hard for you to read, but actually, let's, let's go to the next one. Sorry. So this is what's right underneath that monument. Along the way of life, someone must have sense enough and morality enough to cut off the chain of hate. This can only be done uh, by projecting the ethic of love to the center of our lives. So as I read that, I was like, yeah, God, that's, that's what this is about. Falling in love with Jesus is breaking chains, man. But getting it centered to our life. Another quote, we'll go back to that first one we just skipped, if you don't mind. The question is not whether we'll be extremists, but what kind of extremists will we be? Will we be extremists for hate or for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice, for the extension of justice? Man, I love this guy. He just he blows my mind. And then a few of my favorite quotes, we'll put that out there. Hatred paralyzes life. Love releases it. Hatred confuses life. Love harmonizes it. Hatred darkens life. Love, say it with me now, illuminates it. That's a good word right there, isn't it? Yeah. That's my favorite one, too. Love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. How many of you know that's good news right there? Yeah. Talk about someone who understood the power of love and its ability to transform. Way to go, MLK. We celebrate you with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind. All right, if you're at John 21, say amen. amen. Put your hand in your Bible, one hand in your heart, and say this with me. Father God, Father God. open my heart open to my receive heart. your word today. Word. And Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. open my mind receive your truth today and send your hand to your neighbor and say out loud and proud Jesus bless my neighbor to live out your commands today <laughs> be loosed <laughs> that's awesome all right well let's make Jesus famous shall we verse 17 that's where we're going to start verse 17 chapter 21 he said to him him being Peter of course the third time Simon, son of John, do you love me? Let me just pause there just for a minute. So here we are the third time. We recognize last week we, we heard that phrase over and over again. Jesus asking the question, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And him responding, yes, Lord, I love you. And now we get to this third time. And I don't know if you've noticed, if you've read these passages and if you've been following along in the devotional, uh, you'll, you'll be reading them over and over that Jesus doesn't use the nickname, does he? He doesn't use Peter the rock. And I always thought that's a really in interesting thing. Was he, was he kind of getting on Peter about this thing? But I, I think it had a deeper meaning as we've been talking about why John 21 is so important in your Bible. It's that idea that I think that he's saying, you know, it, you're always going to be my rock. You're always going to be there. But the reality is now I want to move you from this description of what is your behavior, the rock, who you'll be in your behavior, to your identity as simply a child of God. You're to Simon, son of John to me right now. You're my child. I love you that much. You don't, you don't have to be impressing me with your behavior right now. And I, I think that's really important because in the kingdom of God, God is more impressed with who you are than what you do. Let me say it again. He is more impressed with who you are than what you do. He, he loves your nickname. Go ahead, boo. You're great. But the reality is this. He says, listen, Peter, I'm going to call you Simon, son of John, because I want to take you right back to the core. Even as Pastor Mel was sharing there, it's like before you were formed in your mother's womb, I was singing over you. That Peter, before you were even created, before you even thought that you were the rock, not like the rock I like with the eyebrow, you know what I'm saying? And I can do it too, don't, don't play, don't play, right? I know, I, I, I got to restrict it to who I do it to because it, it, it does things to people. I just mess with you, I just mess with you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, now you got me all messed up, man. 
But I really, I really believe that. I believe that God was calling out his very identity, the one that God was singing over, Simon, son of John. This is, this is really important to me. Do you love me? And again, because identity is in who you are, not what you do. And of course, Peter responds. Peter felt hurt, right? That, the Greek translation of that is very simple. He felt vexed. We don't use that word very often in the English language. You vexed me. That sounds like a disease, doesn't it? You vexed me. But the reality is he became sorrowful. He was grieving. I mean, it, it deeply hit him because now here's the third time. And as we learned from Pastor Andrew last week, that the reality of it, it's kind of this parallel of another time where Peter had denied Jesus three times. And now Jesus hits the third time of the question. So it had to trigger Peter's mind, Simon, son of John's mind that, oh, this is where he's going with me in our personal space. And I'm feeling deeply grieved about what I did. <clears throat> Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And again, that threefold question we answered last week is so important, that exchange between Jesus and Simon, son of John, just back and forth, because I think it was just not only this call of renewing relationship, it was just a redemptive grace of saying, Peter, I, I saw what you did those three times, but you know, I love you. I love you like three times I love you. Not like three times a lady, but like three times I love you, man. Some of you know that song, some of you don't. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. And Andrea shared last week, of course, I think, if we, I think we have that quote up there, that the love for Jesus must be demonstrated by obedience to his call and service to his people. That was a great word last week. Great job, Andrea. Because that is so true. That's what Jesus is saying. Listen, this, this thing about love, it has to move to a level of expectation that there's going to be things that you're called to. But then he, he responds, Peter, Simon, son of John responds, Lord, you, you know everything. Say that with me. You know everything. And then he doesn't stop there. And then he says, you know that I love you. Say that with me. You know that I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. So just, just for a moment, just let me geek out with you. So when, you know, I, when I read through a passage, I read through it. <clears throat> then I go back to the original language and I read through it. And, you know, don't be impressed. You could do that on Google too. And, and it just, I just read through it and I, I look at all the grammatical structures of it. Because I, I, want, I want the word to, to speak to me. They spent time thinking about what would be put in God's word. So it's important, right? So I'm reading it through and, and over and over, Jesus says, do you love me? He goes, you know, Lord, you know I love you. Do you love me? Yeah, Lord, you know I love you. Then here, Lord, you know I love you. You know everything. You love me. And, and it's really interesting. All the other times about this, you know everything, John chooses to use the word as Peter spoke it out and Jesus heard it. The first time, Lord, you know everything, is really the, the know that we think about, that knowledge piece. It's, it's every detail. It's every fact. Lord, you know everything. I mean, you're the God of the universe. You, you know everything, every detail, every fact. You know all these things. Then all of a sudden, Simon, son of John, throws this out at us. And he says, but you know that I love you. And that word know is a different Greek word. And so he, whenever that happens, when you're reading God's word, you just kind of lean in and say, why would you change the word? And this, this no from facts and, and, and details moves to the no, which is more describing an intimate personal knowledge of my life. It's like Simon, son of John saying, hey, Lord, you've walked me. You know personally everything about me. You know me. I am known by you. It's no longer facts. It's an intimate, personal relationship because I want to tell you this, your first fill-in, love must move us from just knowledge to knowing. Let me say it again. Love must move us. This falling in love with Jesus must move us from just knowledge to knowing. Let, let me help you with that. As I mentioned, I was in San Diego just a few days ago and I, when I was there, you know, I, I, I went to school in San Diego. So I spent four years of my life there. And when I first got there, I, I had to learn the city. I had to get knowledge of the city. I had to know where to eat. Where was Roberto's? Where was Alberto's? Where was, you know, taquitos with guac? Because that will change a college person's life, <laughs> especially if you're from Canada, okay? And so I had to know where, where's the beach? Where do you shop? What do you do this? And of course, last and last, where do I go to class? You know, that was important too. Anyway, so <laughs> knowledge. I, I had to get, gain knowledge of the city. But once I was in the city, I knew my city, man. 
And can I just say, my city knew me. I, I, I mean, there was just a personal relationship I had with San Diego. My, my heart wanted to stay there forever. I, it was connected. You, you hearing me? So I had knowledge, but then I moved to this relationship of knowing my city. And then, I, you know, when we would go places, I didn't need my map book. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> map book? <laughs> Thomas Guide? <laughs> Who's that fella? Right? This is long before GPS and your phone and Surrey telling you what to do. Lord have mercy. Right? I, I didn't need them. I knew my city. I'm like, now you go left and that's G Street and that's where, you know, Old Town and da da da. And you take a right there and there. So Joanne and I are back there. And all of a sudden, you know, she's looking at me like, hey, you, this, is your, this is your place. This is your city. Right? And I, I didn't know where I was going. <laughs> I mean, and, and if you have some misdirection in San Diego, you're, you're in Mexico, <laughs> right? You're like, hola, <laughs> and you gotta turn around and come on back, man. Thank God you're bilingual, Joanny. you know what I mean? So, hallelujah. So, so I, I realized, wait a minute, and I guess here's the example, it's like, you can have knowledge, go to knowing, and then all of a sudden, when you're not around it intimately, you move back to a knowledge and then you're relying on your knowledge and it's not that good. And so then while I was there, I was reminiscing about my roommates. I had the privilege of having the, the same four roommates all the way through college, which I know is rare, but it was just, it was a real blessing to me. I didn't realize it until after I graduated how remarkable it was. And when we first met and we were all kind of hanging out, it, it was, you know, we didn't know each other. This was kind of a thrown in and it just worked out. It was amazing. And, but it's like, where are you from and what are you about? So it was all about a relationship based on knowledge, right? Make sure you're not some kind of ax killer that's gonna kill me in the middle of my night while I'm studying or something. You know, so it's all of those, that's what happens in my mind, just so you know. And so it's knowledge. But by the end of the four years, man, these guys were like brothers to me. We had been through struggles, through tough times, good times, so many crazy things. I mean, they knew my heart, I knew their heart. Now you fast forward her many years later and, you, and it, we, we've kept in touch, but it's not the same anymore. So that knowledge that moved to knowing is now knowledge. I, I have knowledge that my, one of my roommates is a lawyer in Northern California. I have knowledge that one of my other roommates is Dr. Frankenstein. He's a genetic biologist in La Jolla. He is Dr. Frankenstein. And I have knowledge of that. I, my other roommate is a private investigator in LA. I have knowledge of Anthony. I have knowledge of that. Because you know what happens is knowledge makes us now acquaintances. Knowing makes us friends. And knowledge, love and knowledge, it, it starts, there, but it's got to move to knowing. And, you know, and then just to, to, to round it out, because you know, it's important to recognize that there's a friendship, knowing, that's really important. But then it moves to this intimate love. So the one that I am that with is Joanne. And, and when I met Joanne, I had to learn all the facts about her. I had to learn, you know, what is, what is Puerto Rico? What is that? <laughs> glory. <laughs> it's glorious is what it is. And so that's, I, we're fasting, so everything, my mind goes to food so quickly. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So, but, you know, at first it was all about facts. You know, we had a lot of facts. We had to learn about each other. But now, you know, over many years, we, we, there's a knowing. I mean, Joanne can read my mind. She can finish my sentences. I don't even have to look at her and I know when I'm in trouble. <laughs> last night I was saying something, I told the congregation last night, I was like, Joanne's at home, but I know she's looking. <laughs> and she's an intercessor, so I know she already knows ahead of time. So it's like, it's double trouble. But it's, it's mostly good, not bad. So this, this knowing, I, she knows how to make me laugh and how to make me smile, how to get my heart elevated. She knows me like nobody on the earth knows me except Jesus. But can I tell you, that took work. How many of you know that that kind of relationship of knowing takes work? And, you know, if you're in relationship, whether you're single and you're dating or you're married, you, you know the statement that's kind of lethal. I thought you knew me. <laughs> Not, I thought you had knowledge about me. There is a deeper, I thought you knew me. Are you hearing me? And you know, then I, I know things about her. I know the things she loves. I you know what makes her smile and laugh and elevates her heart heartbeat. And, and I, I know what kind of candy she likes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 
We've been thinking about food a lot, huh, baby? It's, I hear you, man. It's like, glory, best thing. I know what kind of purses she likes. I know what kind of house payment it'll cost me to get one. I know all of those things, man, because I know her. I know her heart of justice and prayer and worship and love for God's people and for our family. And Amen. as a mother, man, I know my girl, man. Amen. And I don't want it to ever change because there's a difference between knowledge and knowing when it comes to love. I read a definition of the difference between knowledge and knowing, and it went like this. Knowledge is an intellectual process. Knowing is a spiritual, emotional process. I think that's true. Or knowing is a spiritual process. Knowledge comes from acquiring information. And I love this line. I've never heard this way, said this way before. Knowing comes from ownership. It's like, this is mine. I own this. I know this. Another way to think about it is saying this. Uh, knowledge is saying a tomato is a fruit, but knowing is not to put it in a fruit salad. Right? <laughs> That, that's, that's where we're at. So if you're just joining us in this series, we're in this thing about falling in love and rediscovering our love for Jesus. So some of you in the room are, yeah, I'm rediscovering that love. For some of you today, like last night we had three people that it was a new discovery for them, new discovery of God's love. That's awesome, right? And we're, we're hoping that this beginning of the year is a time of renewal, of falling deeply in love with him. And we, we started with talking about what it means to fall in love with Jesus is first to, to accept his love. We got to first do that. If, we, if we're going to fall in love, we got to recognize that there's an acceptance of his love and that, you know, there's nothing we can do, that reckless love of God. I love that song. Man, it's amazing to me. And then Pastor Andrew talked last week about love has expectations. And man, how do you know that love does have some expectations? It really does. It's so important. And to this morning, I just want to talk about what, what love knows. And next week, we'll talk about what love demonstrates. And I can't wait to get there next week with you. But here's the big question for our time. How do you respond to, do you love me? You know I do. Do you love I just can't help it. Do you love me? Is it I love you with knowledge, God? Or I love you with a knowing? <laughs> Because here's the thing, beloved, is it all about the facts and right behavior, which are so important, right? They're so important. We got to have the facts and we got to kind of know what our behavior is. Or is it about knowing and being known by him? I, I, I believe knowledge can lead us to knowing, but it has to be intentional. I think a lot of people, a lot of church people are happy and satisfied that they have knowledge. But can I tell you, there's a whole other group in our history book that had a lot of knowledge, but they didn't know God and they didn't even know Jesus when he was in front of them. It has to be, if I can dare say, willed into place knowing. And I think one of the things that Jesus is trying to show Simon, son of John, AKA Peter, that you had knowledge of me and you thought you knew me. But now here we are again at the fireplace of grace after your betrayal. Where did your knowledge lead you, Simon, son of John? In a place of betrayal and abandonment and doubt. And, and I, I think you thought you knew me, but you didn't. But I want you to know me. I want you to really know me. And I think taking this important step, this aspect of falling in love with Jesus is if we don't realize that we are the objects of God's love and not little fact finders for him. We will want our knowledge to be the merit by which we are judged by him and how we judge others in equality to us. And then it becomes, the more facts I know, that'll be the motivation of our behavior. But beloved, what happens when the facts fall flat? Jesus knows it will not be enough to sustain us. I believe he asked Simon, son of John, all three of these questions, not only for the redemptive grace of everything of these three betrayals, but also to push Peter, Simon, son of John, to the point of saying, you really know everything about me. That's where Jesus wants to get him. Beyond the knowledge to the knowing, and as a result of that real knowing is that to know that Jesus really loves him just as he is. Not what he can prove to him. Not how he even blows it. That should just free a whole bunch of people in this room right now. And how good God's love is. And to know the power of having knowledge and knowing. And can I just tell you, beloved, we got to have both. But if I were to put my bet on something, I'd want the knowing. 
And when I've been in this place, or I've been in other churches, I've been places around the world, I can tell a mature believer in Christ by just these two words. Is it about the knowledge of Jesus or do you know Jesus? Because here, let me just throw this out there. Might as well, because yeah, we have a few minutes. Every faith system has a knowledge of Jesus. They do. They all, some, some even mentioned him, him in their books. And some equate him as, you know, a prophet. Some, the brother of Satan. Which is not true, by the way. So the reality that knowledge is going to help you in this whole thing in Christianity is true to a degree, but, but so to every other faith system. It's the knowing that shifts. It's the knowing that deepens. It's the knowing that frees you. It's the knowing that liberates others through you. That's why I think Jesus, all through God's word, as he, especially in the Gospels, as he was confronted, and he, especially by religious people, he would say, you know scripture, but you don't know the power. You know scripture, but you don't know the capital W word. Does that make sense? I'm not you know, downplaying scripture. It's really important. I have a high value for God's word. But I have a higher value for the one who gave me the word. Does that, does that sound all right to you? So this idea of having both is really important, but I think, I think what I've seen in experience in, you know, is that people that have really fallen in love with Jesus, they have the knowledge piece, but man, they, they just seem to know him like, like they know their own skin. That's what I want for us. So I was thinking of a way to kind of make this practical for us and differentiating between knowledge and knowing. And where my mind went was the story of the Wizard of Oz, which says a lot probably about my mind. <laughs> so you, you know the characters, right? Shout them out, shout out their names. Go ahead. Okay, so most of you have seen it. I'm not even gonna ask you to raise your hand if you've not seen it. May the Lord bless you. Make his face shine upon you. You know, if you haven't seen that, or at least The Wiz, see at least one of the classic versions. See, just make, try, beloved. Okay, I'm fasting media, Pastor. Don't mess me. Okay, I got you. So there they all are, right? And I love this story. So just track with me for just a minute. It's, it's a loose analogy, but it, it kind of works. So there's the characters. Now, you know what each one of them wanted. What, what did the Tin Man want? What did the scarecrow want? Praise. Now make sure you say this right. What did the lion want? Praise. Thank you. Some of you see good. Thank you. Saturday, they got that all messed up. Courage. Now you got to say it like you would say it. Okay, anyways. And then what would Dorothy, what did Dorothy want? She wanted to go home, right? And I thought about this. I thought about what was it in Dorothy that compelled all of those guys to leave their place of comfortability and safety to ease on down the road? Really, what, what was it? But just, just... Oh, you guys, you're great. Almost there. What, what compelled them? Because here's just what Dorothy did. She's just, ease, ease on down, ease on down the road. Man, stop, Aaron. <laughs> stop singing it. Stop messing with me. Um, ease on I'm staying over here for a while until you just behave. <laughs> Worship pastor. Um, because here it is. She's, she's on her way. She's got an objective. She wants to go home, right? She heard a rumor that there's this wizard. And if she follows this yellow brick road, she will get there. So she got there, heard this rumor from these remarkable little people in little houses. <laughs> Man, I love those guys. Lollipop kids, they're the best, <laughs> right? And she heard this rumor and because she wants to go home, right? And then the bubble lady shows up and says, this is how you get there. 
Which, by the way, let me just spoiler alert. Why couldn't she have told her at the beginning? Just click the heels, girl. <laughs> Some people are not as efficient as I think, right? Yeah, right, right, right. Because you got to learn on the journey. I, it, it works. It does. It works. Okay. So she's on her way. She's got things to do. But she stops with each of these characters, sees their plight, amazing, right? And each of them have something that they want. And she says, simply says, not in these words technically, but she says, I heard a rumor that there's this guy at Emerald City that basically, if that's what you want, if he's gonna get me home, I bet you he can get you a heart or a brain or some courage. So what, what I'm saying is this, they, they follow her, right? But do they follow Dorothy because they know her and love her or because she has a piece of knowledge for something they want? In the beginning, you're right. They are only following her because she's given them a little bit of facts of something that they need and want. They don't really, really care about Dorothy yet. We, we've seen the movie, so it messes with our mind. We think it's very... They're not there yet. And I would suggest that they follow Dorothy because it is something they want personally to gain, not because they feel the need to know her or love her. And yet something in Dorothy compels the journey. And to me, to me, in my mind, it just sounds a little bit like the disciples in Jesus. The story begins with John the Baptist saying, look, there's the yellow brick road, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Messiah, the, the Savior, the Redeemer, the one who is the Restorer, the true King, the one who's going to make everything right. And these guys and gals begin to follow this poor carpenter from Galilee with the knowledge that maybe if we follow him, we will get what we want. Freedom from the Romans because it's so unjust around here and we want to be top dog again. We want some power because our power will become, become available to us because we're in proximity to the true and coming King. Because some of that group were what they call zealots. They had other desires for Jesus. When are you going to be king, Jesus? Who's going to be top dog, Jesus? I, I would just posit that their motivations at the beginning was about a knowledge piece. Because that's all they knew. And here was this religious rabbi, this leader who was saying some amazing things. They were in awe of what he was teaching. So it was like, give me more knowledge of that. But you, you know that it wasn't defined yet in their heart. Because when they get to John 14, and Jesus says, we sang it today. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then there's the bold disciple, Philip. He's like, uh, teacher, <laughs> how do we know which is the way? Show us the Father. And Jesus is like, Wow, bro, <laughs> three years I've been with you. And from the very beginning in the gospel, of John, I only do what the father's doing. I've come to reveal the father's heart. Three years. So don't feel bad. They didn't get it because they were pursuing knowledge. They weren't yet ready to move into the knowing. Do you see what I'm saying? And that, 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 that kind of is there until, until. Something had to shift, that a literal crossroad had to come at Yellow Brick Road. Because remember when they get to Emerald City and they're in front of the wizard and they've gone through many adventures and that's solidifying their heart like the disciples. But when they get to Emerald City, Jerusalem, they find out that what's really going to happen is going to cost them possibly everything they have, their entire life. And they're, they're in front of the wizard. Let's put that picture. They're in front of the wizard. Now they're like, oh, this is not as good. And like many of us, we're like the cowardly lion. This is what he does when he knows it's going to cost his life. Point your eyes to the screen. Now go. But what if she kills this fight? I said go. That's what knowledge does. This is going to cost me. I'm out. So our first fill-in is not grammatically correct. I'm, I apologize, professors and teachers already. For love to move to knowing, it must embrace what I call the costing. 
It has to embrace this cost. Falling in love with Jesus costs. And could this be what Jesus was trying to get Simon Peter to? Was he getting to a place, place of saying, do you love me? And he wanted him to get to a place like, you know me like no one else, but you love me in spite of it. And that's what God wants more than anything. I want you to know me at that level. And for the characters of the Wizard of Oz, real courage, real heart, real wisdom come to play only when the crossroads happen and Dorothy's taken away. She's taken by the wicked witch. She's taken to the castle. And they have to sacrifice now to rescue that which they love and storm the castle. Because love moves to knowing when who you want is more important than what you want. Are, are you with me? So for them, they, they, they wanted wisdom, they wanted courage, they wanted a heart. But man, it was going to be proven only through sacrifice. I got to storm the castle to get my beloved back. Because who I want is more important than what I want, even to the point that it may even cost my life to follow you. Falling in love is more than knowledge. It's knowing. It's moving us to that place. And can I tell you, beloved, this is what we get afraid of. We think, well, if we do that, we're not going to get anything out of this thing. But that's not true. Because in this next slide, you'll read from Psalm that when you know God, the scripture says, Psalm 910, those who know your name put their trust in you. When you know God, not just have a knowledge of God, when you know God, you get the rest of his benefit. And can I just tell you, when you know God and you get the rest of his benefit, all of the knowledge pursuits of what you want and need are built into his name. It's built into who he is. Why would you want that to be a one moment a week experience of give me a little bit more knowledge that will help me maybe sustain tomorrow? Maybe. When you can have the knowing God in your presence every day to sustain you. You need beauty, bam. You need provision, bam. You need goodness, bam. You need glory, bam. You need favor, bam. Because his name makes it available to know him. You know how it is when you see someone you got the googly eyes for. You're like, I got to know their name. Some of you haven't dated a long time, but you know what? Single people are like, yeah, I get you. Pastor, I get you. Your eyes are like, yeah. Woo, take it down now. Get holy. But the reality is that is the truth, isn't it? That that knowing, I, it's who, not what. And knowing brings all the attributes. And, but that cost, man, mm, that's what gives access, I think, to this deeper love of Jesus. Man, they wanted it, but man, it was about who they wanted. Even at the end, which is so fascinating, let's put that next slide up. You know, if you, if again, spoiler alert, and again, if you haven't seen it, <laughs> even at the end, they all get what they want, right? You eat bloopers, uno, you know, all those things. They get the little diploma and a little medal and stuff, right? And this little clock heart, you know what I'm saying? And then it comes to Dorothy, and it's like, well, what about Dorothy? And he's like, ah, oh, well, yeah. And what moves me about this movie so much is it feels like to me like they're like, we will give you everything, Dorothy. And even like the disciples, please stay, don't go. But there's that level of sacrifice because love has to move. <laughs> you know love's moving to knowing when what you give is more important than what you get. I think that's exactly what we're talking about with Financial Peace University, exactly what Pastor Mel was sharing, exactly what worship was setting us up for. I didn't even have to say anything. It was all just this glorious, beautiful, wonderful setup. That really, it is love. I, I know I'm moving into mature love with God, falling in love with Jesus when it's no longer about what I get. It's just what I give now. How are we doing? So, you know, how do we do this? And I'll try to wrap this up. You have to decide that your relationship with God is not just about what you gain, but what you give up in order to know him and have him know you. It, it really is an intentional thing, guys. 
That's why we start the year with fasting every time. And I, I love it. You know, we announce at the beginning of the year and there's the groan of despair. Oh, all right. I get it. It's tough. It's hard. But I, I know for me, it brings clarity for me. It brings direction. I hear his voice more accurately. When I'm hungry, I'm like, God, I just want to hunger for you because I realize I really love certain foods. And I'll just, sometimes I think I love it more than you because I run to it before I run to you for my comfort. Am I getting too close to y'all? Right? And it may, maybe it's not food. Maybe it's media. Maybe some of you are fasting with media or you're, you know, you're giving your thumbs a rest. Praise the Lord. You know what I mean? And it's like, you're like, I kind of love this whole who's going to post to my Facebook and like me today more than I want to hear the affirmation of the Savior of the world saying, I think you're beautiful. You don't have to do anything and you don't have to impress me and you don't have to go on that glorious vacation and have more friends. It's intentional, beloved. It could be work. It could be all those things that come up. You have to decide that this is what you want to do. So I came across this great leadership principle. It, forgive me if it feels a little secular to you, but it, it's, just, it's really powerful and it helps me understand my spiritual formation. So let's throw it up there. And, it's, and you don't have to doodle it. I put it on the back of your notes. Last night, they're all like trying to draw it. And I'm like, it's on the back of your notes. You're okay. So here... Here, it's really simple. I think our relationship with God starts with this information. There's just lots of dots. We don't know how they connect. Some of you in this room right now, and you're hearing this, is like, okay, that, that's a dot. I'm trying to figure out how this all connects. And I, I was there. I was there at the beginning of my relationship. Like, okay, there are lots of dots. And then knowledge, you know, equipping and growing and learning more facts starts to put the, not, the dots together, doesn't it? It's like, oh, that, that's starting to make sense. But then when we start living it out, when knowledge starts moving towards knowing, and we actually have experience when you actually do stuff, when you actually kind of live into it and you actually, I know God loves me, right? And then you love someone else and you're like, oh, wow, that's powerful. Something happens in the experience and the dots begin to become more clear and some of the other dots are not as relevant and as important anymore. And then as you continue to move, you begin to see, wow, God, you're shaping how my love has a calling. And it begins to give me some strategy in my life. In my, whether you're a home builder or a homemaker, I just, now I have some strategy on how I'm going to do what I'm going to do because you're, it's connecting for me this knowledge to knowing. Then all of a sudden, there's that crazy word intuition, which to me is just knowing. It's just great discernment. It's like, I have great intuition now so that when, when I, I wake up and I breathe out your name and you respond to me, yes, I love you. You're my favorite. I'm like, right on. That's what you said yesterday. Keep it coming. I don't have an ego problem. I'm just loved as a child of the king. So just, that's my problem. So here's the reality of just this intuition now becomes, it becomes natural for me. You want to know the will of God? Move from knowledge to knowing. Because in every day, I'm in love and in relationship with him to a place of intuition. It's like, Fraser, I'm working here. Go there with me. Okay, Lord. I'm not like, where should I go? Who should I talk to? What should I do? It's like, Fraser, I'm working here today because this is where love is leading me today. Would you join me here? Yeah, okay, Lord, I'll do that. But if you're just following by facts and figures and religion, uh, come on, you guys. Give your brain a rest. You already know way more than you're obedient with. So why not try the other way? And let me breathe into you, Jesus, and you can breathe into me. And there's this discerning and intuition of us working together in relationship. Because man, then that's where power and the miraculous begin to flow. And it moves us to a deeper place. So what in your life is hindering that? Have you kept God at a distance because the yellow brick road is hard? Because the knowledge of following God is hard? Because the wicked witches are causing you fear? Because you're not getting your way. Because when knowledge stops and you don't get your way, boy, we get frustrated, don't we? But could it be that God stops you by not getting your way so that you can learn his way and take another step of sacrifice with him? A step of faith where you can't even see what's going to happen next? Oh. Has your knowledge limited your ability to know him by keeping it all factual and not relational? I know that's my struggle. I, I, just, I think I know too much stuff because I love to learn. 
but learning will never be as valuable as loving. The answer, you know, the question is this, do you love me? Yes, Jesus, you know all things. That's true. You know all the facts, God. The key to this whole thing, I think, is the answer of what he says next. You know everything about me. Our good friend, Cynthia Job, who is a board member here at Servants Council, was an amazing leader and wise woman of God, shared this blog with us this week. And Aaron, why don't you come up and we'll wrap up. And it was so powerful to us, to the staff, and it just in light of our fast. And it says this, this blog, it's really cool. I often start my day with reading the Bible and a book of prayer. That sounds more holy than I am. I like this. And right now I'm in the book of Ephesians, the message version, and I, and I read it again and again. And this is what it says. This, 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 listen to this, powerful. Watch what God does, and then you do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant, reckless love, really. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. That, beloved, is not knowledge. That's knowing. So here's my statement. Falling in love is not just knowledge, it's knowing. It's knowing your love. And on the back of your notes, turn there with me. I, it's really important that you have this statement. I want it to just burn into your heart. Knowledge declares that you are loved. That's what knowledge declares. You are loved. Knowing declares, I love you in spite of who you are. Now, some of you might be offended by that, but it's a truth. Knowledge, God loves you. The knowing heart of Jesus, and I love you in spite of everything you do. You blow it, I love you. You think you have it all together? I still love you. You think you're the smartest person in the room? I love you. You think you're the worst failure on the planet? I love you. Because I know you. Because before I said a word, I sang my love over you. Right? Yeah. Here, here stand with me for a minute. God, our heart is to move from knowledge to knowing. For some in this room, they, they're there. They're, they're so far past that. They, there's a whole other word for their knowing of you. But for many of us in this room, we're, we're rediscovering what that means to fall in love with you in a way that's beyond just knowledge, to knowing the beauty of who you are and, and to be known by you and to know that you love us in spite of ourselves. And then, Lord, there are some here today we recognize for sure that have never accepted or understood your love, but maybe today is their day. So, Father, we, just, we, we ask that you would just move in their hearts, that you would begin to help them be willing, be willing to respond to the next step and not to have them have it all figured out. They don't have all the pieces. Not all the dots are going to connect yet, but they're going to take the one major dot, which was you, and say, okay, wait a minute, this, this God, this Jesus, he, he loves me with an everlasting love, and I, I need to receive that and accept that. And he's going to pursue me with a reckless love. There's nothing going to change that. And so I, I better slow down and just let him catch me today. So... I'm going to count to three, and as I get to the number three, if that's you today, you're like, man, I, I, I need to give my life to Christ. I, I need to say yes and surrender to this love, this everlasting, beautiful love. Then we're going to ask that you just raise your hand. You're going to look up at me, and we're all going to pray together. Then afterwards, we'll give you a welcome to the family of God, and then we'll just begin this incredible journey on the yellow brick road together. So one, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He holds the title. No one's going to take it from him. He came to earth because he loves you with an everlasting love and a forgiving love. Two, he proved that love on a cross at Calvary. He proved it by dying for every sin that you would do yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He did it to prove that he is the only bridge between you and heaven. He wants to have not only you get into heaven, but he wants heaven to get into you 
So he did all of that for you. He did all the heavy lifting. He did all of the sacrifice so that you would have a path to have relationship. It's a reckless love, and it's a love I, I hope that you will want to respond to. And just in a moment, I'm going to say the last number, and if that's you, just raise your hand and look up at me. Don't walk out of this place not knowing the beautiful, wonderful, extravagant love of Jesus. So three, if you're here today and you've never said yes to his love or need to rededicate your life, I see that's a great decision today, you guys. Praise the Lord for you. I see your hands back there. Those, that's a great decision. Great decision as a couple, too. That's awesome. And the Lord loves you so much. I just keep scanning the room. Is there anybody else in the room? I just don't want to miss the opportunity. You're, you're here. And let me tell you, your friend who brought you here, your family who brought you here, are not the people who are going to get you into heaven. Only Jesus can do that for you. So you have to make that decision. So just anybody else, I don't want to miss any other opportunity. And I want you to miss that opportunity. All right, that's what we're going to do. We do this as a family, and we all pray together for the four people that said yes to his love. And we do that because I recognize for some people are like, hey, phrase, I want to raise my hand, but it's freaking me out. And it's no problem. We're, we got you covered. But this is what you have to do. You have to be courageous enough to tell someone that I actually fell in love with Jesus today and to also respond and say, you know what? Jesus is deeply in love with me. Because there's a confession of mouth that the Word of God wants you to do. You got to be bold. You got to do that. But I get you if you don't, can't get the hand up yet. Not ready to go Pentecostal on us. We're good. Okay. We're going to pray together. Then we're, at the end, we're going to applaud. Don't get freaked out. And if you want, pa uh, Pastor Mark, actually, he's right in the back there. Well, I'll have you come down here, Pastor Mark. You can greet Pastor Mark, those who made decisions. He'll just give you a quickly, welcome to the family of God, get you started on your journey, and we'll be excited about that. And then I'll close us with a benediction. I'll get you guys out of here. But we're going to applaud at the end. Sound good? All right. Everybody say this with me. Jesus, Jesus. you're the son, of God. the son of God. You died on the cross. Died. You rose from the grave. From the grave. And you're coming, back for me. you're coming back for me. And you did all of that, all that. to prove your love. Prove your love. And, so today, and so today, I accept that love. Accept that love. Today, Jesus, today, Jesus, I'm falling in love with you. Love and today, Jesus, today, Jesus I, recognize I recognize that you already, already love me. So in my, heart, in my heart, I accept you as my Savior, as my Savior and my Lord, and my Lord. In, Jesus name. in Jesus' name. And all of God's beautiful, wonderful people said, Amen. 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 Let's give more a big hand. Okay. So a few nights ago, a few, I don't, where, are, where are we? Two, three weeks ago, whenever. Um, we had a Saturday night service, and uh, we had like our Supernatural Saturday. It was really powerful. And our prophetic artists, they hang out over there. Mallory and Diana and a few others were there. And they, they did all this artwork, and then they do it all, and they give it away for free. They're just prophetic words over people. It's powerful. So Mallory had one left, and I, I was eyeballing it the whole night. Whole night. I'm out. Whole night. <laughs> And the whole night, I'm like, man, I hope no one takes it. I hope no one takes it. But then I was like, all right, Lord, if someone needs it, they need it. But then I was like, but, you know, I really want it. And so then after, I think I asked her, I said, can I take that one? And you're so great. She said, yeah. So it's just this really beautiful, simple drawing, and it says no. And so I've been holding on to it. And I thought, I don't, why do I have this, Lord? Because I think someone here needs to have this today. So I'm just, I'm going to hold on to it, and so I, I don't know what's going to happen. So if they, a whole bunch of people come, then we have to photocopy it, and that's how it's going to be. And Kathy, you're here. You'll help me out, right? Thank you. My amazing administrative assistant. Yay, Kathy. So, but I just felt like it was today as a declaration for us as a church that we're a known people. Amen? Okay. So that'll be someone or a bunch, and we'll figure it out. And there's the artist. She'll sign it for you. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Sorry. Okay. Extend your hands. Lord, thank you for these amazing people. I love them with just so much love. They're so awesome. And I ask that, Lord, that today they would experience your peace and that they would know that they are loved in spite of anything they've done. And that when they leave this place, they will leave not just with the knowledge of Jesus, but they will know the deep love of Jesus. And may, as they leave this place, may all of your goodness follow them and go ahead of them 
And whatever they may be facing on Monday or even this afternoon, may you be so very present that they will know without a shadow of a doubt that you are for them and never against them. Bless them, I pray, in the name of Jesus. And all of God's incredible people said, amen. God bless you guys. I love you. I'll see you sometime this week.